Hey, welcome everybody to Around the World series. Um, Around the World is an open and ongoing conversation about the impact of underrepresented and marginalized communities in design. Our series aims to recognize and celebrate and amplify a variety of perspectives highlighting different demographics monthly. So as we continue our discussion during Black History Month, and as we honor the cultural contributions of the Black diaspora, now often recognized within the broad landscape of modern design. Our guests reflect a few of many different uh, ways Black designers approach their craft. Though our session will examine historical content, we'll also explore tangible and actionable strategies towards change. Now, throughout the conversation, feel free to jump in with your questions uh, using the QA feature, and we'll answer as many as we can find, or I'm sorry, as many as, as we can get in. So, so now I'm gonna turn the conversation to our moderator, Kiara Hol Hol Holroyd, excuse me, along with the DEI chair for AIGA Connecticut. Uh, she's also the co-founder of Track 2, a community for creatives of color looking to pursue their passions and, thr and thrive in their authentic paths. Kira also works in the corporate space as a DNI manager for a global entity advocating for equity, visibility, and opportunities for, person for professionals of color. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Kiara. Thanks, Kim. Thank you, thank you. Um, so it's really wonderful that we're gonna be having this conversation, especially on the AIJ Connecticut platform. Um, and with me today are four dope artists who are challenging long accepted narratives in design. And I'll take a moment here to briefly introduce each of them. So first up is Brandon Middleton. Uh, Brandon is a lover of all things technical, musical, and educational. Based in Silicon Valley, Brandon has worked for Amazon, Microsoft, Cisco Systems, Slalom Consulting, the Wounded Warrior Project, and Google over the last 15 years. And Brandon has a passion for his community and has served as a board member of the Silicon Valley Education Foundation, uh, the San Jose Repertory Theater, and as a board fellow at the Mural Music and Arts Project in East Palo Alto, California. Thank you, Brandon, for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Pleased to have you here. Next up is Wale Adekandi. Uh, Wale is an award-winning designer animator for NBC Universal. He has extensive experience in designing compelling, uh, designing compelling and effective visual communications in all mediums from concept to completion. And as lead designer on numerous projects, Wale's goal is to create really awesome graphics while fostering an atmosphere of teamwork. Uh, Wale is distinguished and has won several awards, including a VDA Silver Award for the House of Cards documentary in 2010, and an Emmy Award for the Inside, of, Inside the Mind of Google documentary in 2009. Wale, it's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up, and my partner in crime, a native of the Dominican Republic, Julio Ramirez, is here with us today. Julio moved to the US in 2010 to pursue his dream of telling stories and creating emotional connections through art and branded storytelling. He's worked with brands like JBL, AKJ, Under Armour, and Best Buy with co-branded products with Demi Lovato and Steph Curry. I'm obviously in the right room or the wrong room, depending on uh, everybody's bios. Along the way, he's received recognition by magazines like Genko Design and Art Station, as well as the Connecticut Art Directors Club. He's currently the art director for i2 Systems, an LED lighting manufacturer based in Connecticut, whose features can be seen at places like the Highline, Comcast Tower, 21st Century Fox headquarters, and Google offices. And in addition to his design work, Julio has a passion for soccer and teaches with Dig USA, a nonprofit that brings chess and soccer to underprivileged kids in Connecticut. Thanks, Julio, for the time. Pleasure to be here. And last but certainly not least, Ameka Rajis is the VP of User Experience at J.P. Morgan Chase. He's worked on some of the world's top brands, such as Nike, Reebok, NBA, NFL, NHL, HBO, all the acronyms, Sports Authority, Dick Sporting Goods, Bowflex, and many more. Good gracious. As a UX UI designer, director for the last 10 years, Ameka has mentored some of the industry's top talent and has managed large international products. Oh, projects, excuse me, products too, probably. Um, and teaching everything from typography and digital compositing to campaign and project management. Ameka has been able to help nearly 90% of his student participants obtain full-time opportunities in the creative industry. 
Ameka, thank you and looking forward to the conversation. Likewise, thanks for having me. You are very welcome. All right, so thanks to all of you for joining me. Um, again, hope for, hopefully the conversation that we started off with uh, we'll be able to get itself into the conversation that we have prepared. So just to ground us in some facts, you know, we like to start off with some data. Um, and this is for anybody who is, is ready and willing to jump in. Um, a recent study conducted by AIGA and Google found that only 3% of designers are Black. And when we look at Black women in design, that number definitely dwindles further. So what do you think contributes to this lack of representation? I think it starts in, in college um, and also um, your, your high schools. Um, I was fortunate that my high school had a art major studies in high school. So that it steered me towards going towards an art degree. And uh, I, I didn't think I knew anybody else. I even had that at their high school. So I was fortunate there. And then when I was in college, I, I noticed a lot of kids would drop out um, after like one or two semesters. and. Uh, I felt like they, they were discouraged in a sense by, by the uh, facility, you know, the, the faculty and, and just the people around them, because there's always be one or two versus, you know, 50 in other different uh, majors. So they wouldn't feel like they belong, so they would drop out. Yeah, I'll also, I, I second that <clears throat> because uh, Coming up from grade school to high school, you know, everyone, I was, a, you know, an artist, best artist in my class and um, never had any true art programs, not in a, not in grade school, not in high school. And I went to uh, Catholic schools, which were considered to be, you know, pretty, uh, you know, uh, pretty prominent as it pertains to education. And um, we didn't have those programs in the inner city. So when I went and applied for the University of the Arts, they said, hey, where's your portfolio? And I didn't really know what to have. I, I wasn't introduced to fine arts and things like that until I got into college. But I was able to get in uh, because I was talented, but my skill was underdeveloped. Not only was my skill underdeveloped, but my, my awareness of the opportunities and possibilities um, was hampered by my circumstance that I grew up in. Yeah, I'll throw a little bit on there. Um, grew up in the south side of Chicago and grew up in this like uh, this culture where black and brown people were uncomfortable um, failing publicly or admitting that they needed help. So when it came to, you know, my first semester in undergrad, you know, uh, I was I was used to making fun of people's shoes and cracking jokes on people. And uh, when I started to have a hard time, something inside of me uh, clammed up and would rather fail in silence than to be vulnerable openly and get the help that I needed. So when you look at, um, you know, places that I worked at in the past and um, how much work we've got to do from a diversity and inclusion perspective, I think that that's something that's specific to like uh, underrepresented and marginalized communities. Uh, it's not as comfortable to come out and to admit that you need help or to admit that you don't have it all together because just having made it to college is like an accomplishment in itself and uh, doing what is needed to be successful while there. Uh, we don't have the playbook all the time. We, we need um, more vulnerability and more uh, ability to say, hey, I don't got all this. I need some, I need some assistance here. So that's a little bit of my personal story. I want to touch on that for a second because we had talked about this in the pre-conversation, this idea of getting help and not having it all together. And, and Brandon, I want you to expound, expound on that a little bit because you said that we don't have the playbook for the Black designer. And Brandon, I want you to start, but anybody else that has a, a thought on this, please jump in. But for the Black designer, what needs to be in that playbook? Yeah, I, I can't underscore enough, like, the power of community and networking. Um, very few good ideas like happen without input from other people. Um, very few ideas once executed or even like born and like thought of by that person who got across the finish line with that idea. So I think um, out of like rich dialogue and conversation um, and diversity of points of view and opinions and thoughts come like the, the things that are 
most valuable uh, to our communities and to our society. So for anybody watching, um, for me, that's looked like a whole lot of outreach, um, gathering diverse perspectives before I make certain moves, making sure that I have asked myself, did I think about like the least of these in this design decision or have I considered uh, somebody who's differently abled or uh, taking accessibility requirements into con in, into consideration. So um, getting into a habit of getting outside of my own filter bubble is something that um, I've had to develop muscle memory for. It, it doesn't come natural to us to kind of question our privilege, you know, status, like bias, all of that stuff. But uh, you for sure can feel it when a product wasn't made for you or when something uh, did not take you into consideration and it's sitting on the shelf and you, you you don't have access to it. So that's what I'll add to that. I would like to add a point to that, um, especially I wasn't born in the United States. So my perspective is a little bit different, but evaluating a lot of the circumstances, like I come from a country where like class is is more more of a topic of conversation than race, right? Uh, because we're more mixed in, in a sense. But one thing that I noticed and, and you know, connecting to, to the points that you guys have mentioned is like one of the things that society, especially modern society, has been failing consistently at uh, providing young people is a level of social competence, right? Um, it's really easy to find two or three friends and these are the people that create, define your circle. And, you know, like Warren Buffett says, you, are, you make as much money as the six people you surround yourself with. Um, we have lost that ability of really creating systematic um, models that allow people to really develop uh, social competence, right? So you can be in a group of five people and only feel comfortable with one of them. So this 90% of the things that you want to say, you wouldn't say in a, in a setting with these other five people, because again, going back to how you feel, your perspective or the dynamics of, the dynamics of your environment, who you were raised by, all these factors come into the mix. And I think we haven't been able to shape um, or develop a model that allows people to feel comfortable expressing their opinions without, I mean, we know we're going to get judged one way or the other, right? So it's, it's more than not feeling judged, it's about uh, creating resilience, in, in, especially in the kids, right? Because those are the most vulnerable people. Like, uh, it's like you tell a kid, oh, your shoes don't look good, and that kid is going to be traumatized for six months, right? So it's like, we need to be able to build this level of resilience through like, uh, supporting uh, the ability of, of people to express themselves in a way that is is outside of the spectrum of what we define what is cool. And I think the concept of cool in modern society is extremely dangerous because if you're not cool, you're now cast. At that point, like you start defining yourself in such a binary way that you, lo you lose basically most of the things that can create that spectrum that actually find you as a person. So that to me is a critical and, and that comes from supporting community groups. Like that to me is the essence. Society gets defined by the community, not, not the other way around, right? We think that society defines how the communities develop, but even empires, they're defined by small villages that get together and they grow. Then they need a more complex way of organizing themselves. So everything starts with that core. And if we start supporting that, uh, I think that's how we can actually start giving our kids that tool set to actually develop new new ideas without feeling uncomfortable, in my opinion. All right, I'm yeah. gonna jump in and Go I'm gonna run it back a little bit to the original question because I feel like we went we went on a little bit of a tangent, but okay, moderator. <laughs> but I I, I just want to make because I always do this when I talk go back and talk to the colleges is like like sponsors mentors are like nobody tells you this until it's too late right wait 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 before you go there though yes. for the group yeah define sponsor versus mentor because they're two different things so all right. all right break it down for us tell us what you're talking about i break it down so a mentor is somebody you can go talk to for advice they can guide you you know give you guidance a sponsor gets you a job a sponsor is like we're going over here I'm gonna talk to this guy. We're gonna get you a job today. You know, that's a sponsor. They'll put they'll put their name on it. Where a mentor is like could be your best friends, could be you know that uncle that you always go to for advice about money or whatever the case may be. But creating a group of mentors and then also a group of sponsors is very important. And you find out a little too late. I feel like you know, like I was like probably in my 30s when I start realizing should have been doing this 10 years ago. You know what I mean? 
and uh, and then you see everybody else around you doesn't look like you already was hip to that, you know. So so like that's part of the whole thing as far as us as a community. We need to help each other raise up, you know what I mean. So that's part of it. Um, always you know networking, obviously networking, you know, and you know um, and being community groups like you said, but like like for example groups like Blacksmith, you know the the Slack group where. You know, if you just jump on there, you could talk to like a hundred designers that are black across the country, which is insanely awesome. Um, so just things like that. But I would definitely say sponsors and mentors is always, always say to people in you know internships for for students. So and then I, I have a question about that because we we're talking about that idea of community and we're talking about opening the doors, um, and I think we sometimes we focus on what we need to be doing more of. But I, I think also too, we're not placing enough emphasis in, and really calling out the things that are happening that are specifically barring us from entry um, into these spaces. So like, yes, we could potentially put more onus on the high schools for showing you know more art and design courses. And yes, we can build each other up through community, but Let's talk a little bit about and, and bring into light the specific barriers of access um, into design. So what do you think are some of the, the ones, the biggies that, contrib that contribute directly to the lack of representation? Um, and in the true spirit of this type of conversation, let's not just call it out. Let's also speak a little bit about what are some things that can be done uh, to combat or to erase some of those obstacles? Well, I think value. Um, when, when you don't know the value of a thing or when you don't actually have, when you can't perceive a thing, then it's not a thing. Um, for instance, when I, when I grew up, um, we, you know, what I knew of was doing flyers for clubs, right? Because I was a, a designer. You get paid 50 bucks or if you're, if, if you know, if you're lucky, you get 150 bucks, 100 bucks, right? And it's not till I met someone that said, hey, I'm a designer. I knew a friend of a friend, knew a guy who was in the industry, black guy who was in the industry, and he ended up taking me up underneath his wing as, a, as a, my mentor. And he said, yeah, I make 60,000 a year. And I was blown away because for me, making 15, maybe the $20 an hour at 18 years old, like, oh, okay, I can live a good life, not really understand the economy. So my perspective, I didn't know uh, the value of things, right? And I didn't have access to things which uh, hampered my perception. So what, and again, going back to the whole thing with shoes and making fun of people, we grew up, we grew up in that, right? So you become like a narcissistic, you have a narcissistic slash inferiority complex, right? And you grow up with that and you don't, you don't you're looking at world through a skewed lens so, but not knowing that design was all around me and then my eyes began to open up like, oh, wow, there's package design, there's this, there's that. And that awareness is what led me to doing the courses and classes um, that I began to develop. And, you know, there were some guys making $12 an hour. Now they make 90,000 a year, right? Just with helping to build the portfolio, professional development. Um, I was that two year dropout from college. While they, I, I, that was me, you know, um, still battling a lot of this the social construct that I grew up in and got in trouble. And to make it to where I'm at is truly an, uh, an act of God. I can't say it any other way. And, you know, it really for me, again, it was value, vision, perception. You know, those are things that hampered me. But when I got those things, uh, they propelled me. Anybody care to jump in on that one before we get into the next question? Or did I make us say it? Because he, he said it. He, he said, said it. <laughs> he definitely said it. So, and I want to build on what you said. I just wanted to be courteous to everybody else in case they had something else. Um, because you talked about the, the world of like UI, UX, and product design. Um, and I saw this played out quite a bit when I was a uh, town acquisition manager at Octagon and you get all of these, you know, young professionals and they're like, oh, you work at sports. I want to be an agent. And I'd be like, 
you know we do everything else that a business needs to do, right? Like there's so many other things that you could do and still be related to sports. Um, and I think that a lot of times industries don't pick up on that. And so the, there's, there's a missing element in what we're doing. So let's talk a bit about where greater representation and design can take us. So let's say at some point we get to the mountaintop, we got the representation that we need, or at least we have a critical mass of black designers um, in the industry. What are things that we're gonna see? Like what's currently missing in UX or product design, interactive and technology overall? Um, and how, how do you see us impacting these avenues once we get into them? I think even like as, as a build up to that, it's like one thing for us to get to that top, I think one of the things that needs to happen is we need to stop glorifying the cool kids. Uh, like for instance, to your point on, on the octagon factor, it's like, well, when you have a young person with talent, let's say an athlete and stuff like that, right? This person gets parade, right? Like this person is just like this token that we use to represent what is cool and we keep perpetuating that model. So every kid that is in the inner cities, in the projects, whatever you want it, they just follow that 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 token, right? That, that's, that's the aim. But getting there is, is a process, right? It's, it's not, it's not a to B, right? So like they don't understand what it takes to get to it. They just understand the the glorified outcome to it. So from my perspective, it's like even before we get to it, connected to things like value is like the concept of exposure. I think our education system has failed preparing us to understand the concept of what what living is, right? Like it's like, oh yeah, you 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 can understand I don't know, trigonometrics or whatever, but you can, you don't know how to not get into that, right? And these tiny concepts, they compound and that's that's the danger of it. So to me, it's like, for us to get there, we need to really start exposing our generation better to not only what UA, UI is or what UX can do, but how it's created, what is behind it. One of the biggest concepts to me is when people say, design with empathy, I'm like, if you don't design with it, empathy is not a goal. Empathy is a process, right? If you didn't design with empathy, you're not designing. You're just creating things that look kind of cool, maybe. So to me, say, if we don't get our young generation to understand the concept of what the, like the design process embedded in everything we do and how that translates and perpetuates, and we forget about being cool, we, we focus on being competent and being purposeful, um, we get a lot of value. And what do I think we get once we, we achieve that goal? Um, hopefully, we don't, we don't use that new earned power to just uh, take advantage of it, right? We use it to elevate our generations uh, moving forward. Because it's really easy to say, well, we have been oppressed for X amount of years, X generations, so whatever number you want to use as a metric, right? Now we're in power. It's up to us now to take control, and we're going to show them better, right? Uh, but I hope we show them better by the example, by being able to uh, open up the, the concepts for new ideas, uh, explaining to people that may not understand it, what thinking about certain factors represent to the final outcome of a design. So to me, it's like the idea of design of empathy be becomes design in its essence. That's to me, it's like the end goal, because once we get to that point, we can support design for Afro-Latinos, um, uh, Polynesians, Southeast Asians, Mongols, it doesn't matter, right? So to me, say, that's what I think we need to really uh, channel and catalyze to make our society move forward. Because at that point, it doesn't matter what topic we're touching, it's all about the process itself. Yeah, I'll throw a little bit on there. Um, from a product uh, design perspective, um, for my nine to five is focused on like designing uh, cloud computing services that have AI and ML as part of them. And you guys have probably seen um, a bunch in the news about um, a few folks that have departed technology companies uh, in the AI space, um, you know, computer vision uh, algorithms, misclassifying uh, faces that are darker skinned and, you know, black and brown. Uh, so I think when it comes to uh, who's actually building the products. There's a lot of uh, upside in having our voices and our skills and just our presence on those teams. Uh, because I think that a lot of folks are, 
are moving forward on product teams and in engineering uh, experiences without all of the perspectives. And historically, uh, maybe the purchasing power of the marginalized hasn't mattered enough to include all of those diverse perspectives and inputs to the table. But as um, this country, you know, Steve Stout wrote the book, you know, the, the, the tanning of America, like we're getting uh, more diverse as the years go by and our purchasing power and a bunch of how we affect economies is starting to, um, you know, be the tipping point where companies and folks who um, have these products that are aimed at not just the mainstream, but like at everybody, they'll start losing value and a little bit of their brand equity with kind of the average consumer and their business is at risk. So it's an actual like business um, kind of survival of the fittest type of decision, whether we're going to start incorporating these practices now and getting the uh, return on that investment in a future generation. Or if we, um, if we feel like uh, it's a zero sum game, we'll take as much of the uh, return in the short term, but then expose ourselves uh, later on down the line. So it's, it's a daily struggle to get more uh, people into the pipelines to get folks into the organization, to build the culture of equity and inclusion on these teams so that once people get onboarded, they uh, feel like they can bring them for their full selves to work and actually do meaningful work there without, um, you know, microaggressions and like all the stuff that drives uh, black and brown people out of uh, the industry, even though they're qualified and talented enough to do the work. So uh, it's two cents for me. And yeah, also, I, right. oh, go, yeah, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. You first, you first. No, I was just going to say just very quickly also too, um, as it pertains to like, you know, hey, how can we impact UX? Like um, you talk about like empathy, you talk about all these other things, um, ethno, ethno, ethnographic research. And when you think about us, um, what is a black person or brown person represent to the majority? Because for some reason, like uh, only uh, black people who can eloquate um, in a particular way that is more geared towards um, the comfort the comfortability of, uh, you know, dare I say, white folks. Um, are accepted, right? And they become a target, right? Uh, a target group to seek their, because there's different shades. When I say shade, I'm not even talking about skin tones, different types of, of minorities and uh, amidst the communities, right? And they don't have a voice. They, they, they're not in a lot of the user research, right? They're not there. Nobody knows to reach for them. See, there are different types. There's there's a quote unquote, like there's different type of education in our community. Some have it by academia, others have it through life itself. And each one is renowned. But it, as it pertains to UX, there's a standard place um, that our ideas are better than your ideas. Our, we're gonna tell you what empathy looks like and what experiences, what humanity looks like in essence. We're going to define humanity. A, a group of folks will say, we're going to define what humanity truly is, right? Because you talk about human-centered design. And we're going to place you in that bucket. But guess what? We're all human beings. We all have different, we're in this country. We have different experiences, different outlooks and perspectives, right? Everything doesn't have to look like you or sound like you to be representational or respected. So users are colorful. And they span the spectrum of just many different dynamics that appertain to life itself. So I believe the more of everyone that gets involved with the conversation around UX, Blacks, you know, uh, Black Latinos, uh, you know, whoever, we can begin to change because Again, when we go into these organizations and we get hired, many times you have to put on another costume, 
You have to put on another persona, right? So when you go to work, it's, hey, how are you, sir? Sir, you go home. What's up, my, what's up, my brother? How you doing, man? You good? All right. Now that's only acceptable in commercials and marketing. Then you can do that there, just not in the workplace, right? You can't do that. Like I've gone into jobs where when I walked in, they're playing and, and, and I was working for pharma. I'm not gonna say the company. I walked in, they were playing old dirty bastard. And they looked at me like, yeah, you like this, right? Lewd, profane. I said, no, I don't even know who that is. I knew who it was. <laughs> I said, I don't even know who that is. I will not have any conversations about sports or rap with them, right? Because you've already stereotyped me. So again, you don't, you didn't, you didn't really care about how I felt or my perspective. You lump, you stereotyped me and you thought you understood me. So again, not to be long-winded, I believe that there has to be a level of understanding and not just designing with empathy, but true love for humanity. Then we can see greater experiences. That's my two. So I love that. And Wale, I see you about to jump in. So I, yes. I but before, before you do, I want to ask this question and maybe you can bridge the two. Um, because when we're talking about like greater empathy and an understanding of who's get, who gets to be a human and who doesn't get to be a human, um, we see that there's a really strong correlation between what is taught and then how we show up in the world. And if we look at design in general, and I would say most, most subjects, but if we look at design in general, we see that the, um, the viewpoint tends to be Eurocentric. So we're not being given that holistic view as we're learning about our Andy Warhols and our, you know, this and that and the gray tone. And this is what the greats look like, right? So while I, I want you to answer the last question, but I also want you to jump into this one, which is what do you think at like if we're looking at a design secondary program, what are some black artists or black designers that should be taught um, and, and how? How should we be studying them so that we have a varied viewpoint and an earlier introduction into who's considered great and who's considered worthy of recognition? Okay, this is a long story here, so all right. Go for it. I'm gonna go back real quick though, but uh, what I wanted to talk about was was the mindset. Once you, like you said, what would happen if we had enough artists um, in the industry? We need to change the mindset and, and the, change the narrative of how Black people are perceived. Everybody sort of touched on it, but if you think about it, who markets to us, right? But we are also the biggest consumer of everything. Percentage-wise, it's not even close, right? So we buy everything, but then we're 3% of the uh, of the artists that are marketing to us to tell us what we should buy and not buy. Oh yeah, you know, we have influencers. We're culturally, you know, people who follow us, but who's actually controlling it? Go to the marketing departments and all these companies, you know, like you said, we're still a small percentage. So we're, we're still being directed, if you know what I'm saying, to buy or to think a certain way. So the... I think the most important thing is how we change the narrative and how, you know, we're, we're perceived and how we perceive, you know? Um, so that's, that was my point for, for that one. So I'll jump into another one. Okay. So history, we can go back to the, the history of mathematics, right? They'll tell you the Greeks invented mathematics and we all know the Egyptians did, right? So, it can go way back as far as history. We're not being taught now. My kids are not being taught in school the right way. So, you know, like you can go back to artists. Like, I feel like the way you do it is, is personally as far as, like, I was lucky enough to be mentored by super dope artists. He's the creative director now at VH1, Victor Newman, best artist I've ever been around. He used to be in charge of BET back in the day before he started MSNBC, but I learned so much from him, from working with him for one year that I'm still talking about him to this day. Um, we need to champion and give people their roses, right? While they're still here, so we can all learn from them. I, I know so many people that he's mentored. So 
I think that's part of it. It's like we need to champion our artists and the people around us that are that are that are giving us life, right? Um, we could talk about Sakani Solomon, right? You know, the, the whole Black Panther um, uh, design and um, you know, um, all different artists, there's people that I know that work in management forces, but I, I think we have to pass it along to each other. Be in that community that we talked about of designers where we can always say, hey, wow, did you guys see what this person did? And, you know, share it in our groups and pass it along so that we can all know and appreciate all the different artists that are around us so that we also have a better feeling about ourselves and our community. So we know, yeah, you know, we got some dope artists that are Black too. It's not just what you're being spoon fed. And um, you know what I mean? Like we know back in, in the house, you know, there's always a different, different history versus what you're taught at school. You know, your parents would be like, well, no, that's not what really happened. So I think we need to keep that up, you know, and, and keep passing passing the story along like the old truth to, um, the whole, uh, what would you say, the truth sayers from back in the day? So um, yeah, that's my answer for that. So try to keep it short. I, I also think that to the point that America made was like, my abstraction of that is like, lately we are the product for the culture and the product of the culture, but we are not the, recognized as the culture, right? It's like, okay, well, <laughs> you wanna play basketball? Here's the Jordans, but uh, you cannot design a Jordan, right? Like, oh, here is this new iPhone. You can have it, you can, you know, you can do everything with the iPhone. You can look cool in college, but you cannot design the iPhone because you may not have enough intelligence or you don't come from the proper background to make it. So, so when it comes to part of reframing this, I think that one thing that has been done really well through the Eurocentric approach to communicating the history of design or the history of pretty much everything is like the celebration of the culture and as a result of it, the individuals, right? It's like you can go and admire Michael Jordan and you can go and admire, you know, I don't know, LeBron James, if you want, if you want, right? It's like, but it's like, again, they just are products of the culture. It's like, how do we actually encompass everything into like, okay, this is the culture, like this is black culture, but we need to look at it outside of like, well, this is our culture. And then this, this is white culture because whether we like it or not, they have been intertwined forever, right? It's like, okay, things that happen in black culture, whether white people adopt it or not, I'm sorry for using the term, you guys get offended, but that's not the idea. Uh, but like whether white people adopt it or not, it's like, this is the dynamic. Black culture gets created, gets adopted, gets appropriated, and then the circle continues. So it's like, how do we actually reinforce the concept of, we have a culture, whether it's connected to any other ethnicity or not, we have ownership of it. It's like, how do we drive this and really represent it in a way that is uh, balanced for us? It's like, okay, well, we have this way of living. We have this way of cooking. We have this way of dancing. Well, this is what we need to celebrate because the people that we're going to be honoring are going to come as a result of what the culture is being, that is being projected and represented, right? Like Michael Jordan wasn't Michael Jordan without basketball. So basketball needed to happen first. The culture of basketball needed to happen first. Then he made basketball cool. So to me, it's like outside of the individuals, because I think we are in this time where the superhero designer and everything, this time, that time is dead. I think for me, like the superhero times were, were done in early 2000s. Uh, you can find like you know, some of these people that are still living kind of the paycheck of that, but there's no more like this is the Andy Warhol, right? There is no more flank law, right? That doesn't exist. Like this concept of collaboration and iteration. So to me, it's like we need to focus on honing in what the culture represents for us outside of buying stuff, right? Like most of the culture that is conceptualized about black people in the United States is related or connected to a product or sport, nothing else, right? There is no culture in black black film. Like you have like Tyler Perry and stuff like that, but it's like a niche, right? That, that is no culture. So to me, it's like, we need to systematically start honing in what represents the culture and how we actually project that in a way that is sustainable for the community. Because at the end of the day, if we do not, and I'm always gonna sound black, like I'm saying the same thing, but it's like, if we don't go back to honing this into the community, it's just gonna break apart. That's my perspective on the matter.
Yeah, could I could I say a couple words about um, you know, we talked about appropriating our culture, but like the culture that I think we should encourage our people to appropriate is corporate culture. So like one of the reasons, the main reasons I went back to business school was to understand how these large corporations think, uh, their responsibilities to their shareholders, um, how they um, gather data, use data, which is now more valuable than oil, right? Um, in order to um, ideate, take these ideas, prototype them, test them in the market, and then launch these products. And until um, we can plainly lay out and make it like super uh, valuable for our young people to be business minded about all the things that they like, whether that's, you know, owning your own Twitch or YouTube channel, or whether that's, you know, taking something that you like as a hobby and trying to turn it, we need to understand the business side of every single thing that our culture is connected to. And then understand that when people ask, you know, if they could borrow us for 30 minutes or an hour to ask us some questions and then use our input as the next hot thing, um, we need to understand like what our power is, like how valuable our data and our knowledge is. And then to make, you know, eyes wide open choices about the types of things that, um, you know, we're going to do in our careers and out in our community. So I would say that I would love to have more of an emphasis on the synthesis of, you know, design and product and engineering and all that stuff married with kind of a very solid um, sense of what a business requires, because at the end of the day, we're trying to build wealth for our families, to take care of ourselves and our communities and to create um, some semblance of generational wealth that'll start to like level the playing fields of the last 400 plus years, right? So um, yeah, I just wanted to add that, that focus on the business side of it is something that I still find lacking uh, in a lot of conversations when it comes to um, like the black and brown community. Michael, go ahead. In my, <clears throat> pardon me, my father, I think I spoke yesterday, my father's from Nigeria, my name, Emeka, right? Gives it away. Uh, my mother's from down south. Growing up, um, I had two sides. So I had this very cultural side. We ate fufu, some nights, some nights it was collard greens and mac and cheese, right? My mom cooked and my father cooked too. So I see two different sides, right? So my cultural side, my, on my father's side, they're doctors, lawyers, my father's an architect. Um, and you don't fail. There were some values instilled in us where you don't fail. But then on the other side, there was more of a synthetic culture, right? That didn't really have any bearings. Um, or any roots anywhere, which uh, created a type of, um, how, what's the word, like a kaleidoscope of life, right? And the like, so we're designing, so we're trying to design and we're using the word human centered and we look at a lot of human emotions and things like that. But when you have, uh, synthetic ideas and ideologies that are not really grounded upon deeper values, can you really bring, can you actually bring value? There has to be education. Um, not that everybody has to go back to Africa to find their roots, but guess what? You know what? It might help if you know where you come from so you see where you're going. Not that you have to start putting on dashikis and stuff like that, right? You don't have to do that. I'm just saying like, if you, for me, my values were deeper. I remember the thing my father taught me, right? I saw my father speak uh, Yoruba, e you know, uh, Igbo, then switch it to English, right? But then I also was, uh, I understood that it was not popular to be African, right? No one cared about where you were coming from except for to make fun of you, like my name is as common as Michael over in Nigeria. Here, I was crushed for it. So again, but why was I crushed? Because of a lack of understanding uh, in my, you know, amongst my contemporaries. So I go back again, just very quickly, just the, the, the synthetic life that we live, 
makes it hard to develop deep human empathy. Therefore, a lot of us when we grow up are, again, are very selfish and self-centered. There's no community because it's actually systematically been placed upon us how we should view ourselves, what is real, what is fake, what is valuable. But see, I, only reason I was able to transcend that for me personally was because of my father and my other side of my family having uh, different sets of values coming into this country. I just want to just throw that in there. I agree with everything that he just said. I'm also Nigerian, I don't know if you know by the name. Um, so it is is instilled, I guess, in, in us to not fail. You know, coming, there is no, you know, you, 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 you're not gonna be a doctor or engineer, what's wrong with you, you know? <laughs> So, so that's part of it. I, I feel like when people know where they're from, it's a different animal. You don't feel like you're this lost soul that can, you know, like meaning like you're, you're, you're the daughter or son of a slave. And, you know, there's this long history of sadness and being used and not having power. Whereas if you know, okay, you know what? My ancestors are from this country. I feel like it gives you a sense of like, you know, um, a belonging, right? A sense of belonging that I don't know for some reason, I feel like it does do something because I like if you can even talk about last year, the year of the return, everybody going to Ghana. I know like a bunch of journalists and uh, a lot of people went back and um, they come back with a different perspective of the world, you know? And, and that's another thing too, like growing up in the US, I knew a lot of people who never left the country growing up. It wasn't a thing, you know? And so like coming from outside the country, you have, a, 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 I guess, a broader sense of the world in a sense. So I, so I, I totally, I agree with a lot of stuff that uh, Amika was saying. Um, so I wanna jump in real quick because I, I what I wanna say is that um, I respect your, both of your opinions from being outside of the United States and having that viewpoint. Um, but one thing I do want to call out for those of us who were Black and born in the United States and who have grandparents and great-great-grandparents who uh, were born in the United States and we don't have the luxury necessarily of knowing where we're coming from, um, it is a sense of community that allowed Black people to stay strong for hundreds of years and to get where we are. Um, and so there have been some very specific attempts to undermine that community. Um, there's also quite a, a big history of us not being able to fully invest in our communities and having, um, and we talked about this before, having some uh, of those specific divestitures codified. So you can't buy here, you can't live here, you can't go to school here. Um, and the dispersal of, of Black folk in the United States specifically as a response to that. So us having to uh, leave our roots, leave the places that we are most connected to. My grandparents, for example, came from North and South Carolina um, and could not live there. They couldn't find a decent place to live there because they weren't allowed. And my grandfather talks about uh, the neighborhood that he now lives in. He was only allowed to be there if he were cutting the grass. Um, so there's nothing except the lack of opportunity that forced my grandfather at like 25 to leave. That, um, but he, you know, he went to Connecticut and had to start everything um, all over again. So yes, we have the, a, a bit of, of community building to do within uh, the Black experience in the United States, but I really want to make the point that we do have it. It is there, it's there in the Black church, it's there in um, the Black communities that feed each other in mutual aid in the rent parties that we throw to make sure that you are straight for the next week. Um, it's there in Black mothers and grandmothers who make sure that you're okay in every single black person who has taken in a child, how many of us have cousins uh, that are just absolutely not related to us? Like at all, like at all, at all. <laughs> but there are cousins because like our mama and them took them in. So it's not all 
it's not all oppression. It's not all us not understanding where we're coming from. So I know I'm not a panelist, but I do want to jump in there as a Black person born specifically in the United States. We have that community. We have that that sense, but absolutely. I think here we lost you for a second. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, I wanted to throw in a little bit of like- Flip it. Oh, sorry. Did you lose me for a second? Yeah, right. we did. Yeah, we lost you. We lost hey, I'm, I, I'm just going to move us on because we have eight minutes and I want to ask one question and I want to end us on a positive note because I think sometimes we do get into the oppression narrative um, and I don't want us to stay there. Projects coming up. It's a deadline. It's due tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, like you got it today. It's due tomorrow. What's the vibe? What are you listening to? What's your setup? How are you getting this project done? Let us know. Put us on. Man. Uh, I'm a big jazz head, and we lost a great one, uh, Chick Corea, in the music community uh, recently. So I've been playing his stuff like nonstop in the last week or so. Um, I got to do music without words because I used to try my hand at being an MC like back in the day. So if I hear like lyrics, I get sidetracked and I stop working and just start vibing. Um, but outside of uh, Chick recently, I love, um, you know, the sounds that like Robert Glasper and like um, kind of new age jazzy hip hop blenders are doing. Um, so that's where I'm at. Uh, Kamasi Washington, uh, Terrace Martin, Derek Hodge. There's a bunch of musicians that kind of hang together uh, whose sound I really, really like. I did marching band to Chuck Korea, and that like hurt me a lot. So one time for the marching band, but definitely two times for Chuck Korea. Julio, what's the vibe? How are you getting this project done? Um... I have the same problem. Uh, but in my case, the same problem that Brandon has, I start like beatboxing. My girlfriend's like, are you all right? But uh, usually I do a lot of conscious rap, which is a realm of rap that is focused on, it's like has roots in Spain and Latin America. It's, it's focused on like, you know, uh, attacking the ideals of, of, of dictatorial governments and stuff like that. And then some of them go into philosophy and the uh, reason for being in existence and stuff like that. So I really like, that really hard, like, let's get it kind of uh, momentum, but with some some great message. And like, I really like fast rap. Uh, I, I love fast rap, but like conscious rap, I really like rap with a message, no glorifying guns or anything like that. Okay, I feel it, I feel it. A makeup? It doesn't have to be music either. I yeah. know Brandon and, and Julio went the music route, but you know, paint the picture. What What's it like you got? It's crunch times, go time. What's crunch happening? Time. Uh, so I, I have three different soundtracks. Um, the first are my kids running around in the background, the pitter patter of their feet. I got like, uh, I have seven children. <laughs> uh, and so ranging from 20 down, down to one, right? And so that's, that's, you know, that's that noise and ambiance is something that I've grown a, a specific taste for. Uh, I love lo-fi. Right, you know, different type of lo-fi beats. Um, they kind of like like jazzy hip hop beats. I think that's really cool. No words, um, no lyrics. And then also the third thing I like I like to listen to is the Bible. Actually, I love to listen to it um, and just let it play in the background. It's really it's really soothing for me, and I I begin to think about things, and it just helps me. Wale. All right, my my go-to my go-to is '90s hip hop with a mix of Afrobeat, right? And I don't know how and, and '90s house, you know, like uh, "Follow Me" vibe, you know, alias that that lane. So I just mix it into a pot, and and I'm I'm gone. I'm liking 90s hip hop and 90s house, for sure. I need to come to that basement party. Do y'all remember basement parties? Do you remember parties? Do you remember breathing <laughs> the same air as other people and not worrying about it? <laughs> what a life we lived, what a life we lived. Um, all right, so one more lightning round question. Um, 
advice to your younger self, keep it like maybe two sentences. Advice to your younger self, any version of your younger self, what are you telling that person? Julio, let's start with you. Um, I, I always wanted to be Dominican Da Vinci and at, at seven, at 14, I realized I was not gonna make it. And the advice that I had to give myself and I will repeat it again is, your, your work doesn't define you, but you're responsible for it. And your only mission in life is to be competent and to be purposeful. Okay, I like that. Let's go uh, to my left while I, you're up next. Advice to your younger self. Um, advice to my younger self will be just to be confident in, in, in your abilities be confident in your choices and, you know, don't second guess yourself so much. That'll be my advice. Definitely could use some of that advice, especially on the second guessing. Brandon, what are you telling? What are you telling little Brandon? <laughs> <laughs> I only have three kids. So I'll tell uh, the younger version of myself or my current kids, uh, laugh with somebody every day. Um, understand that it's not as much of a meritocracy as you thought it was and um, uh, try to be a good role model and representative because you're taking not just yourself into the room but your mom and them your grandma a lot of people um, in your ancestry sacrificed a lot for you to be able to be in the position that you're in today nice all right Amika, close us out <laughs> Which of your seven kids are you giving advice to? I only have one. Do I have uh -huh. the least amount of children on this panel? Actually, Julio probably has the least amount of children on this panel because he doesn't have any, but uh -huh. seven, my goodness. All right. What, yeah. what are you saying? What are you saying? You uh, you contain multitudes. You have value. And uh, I also tell myself, um, finish what you start. I like that. I do. Advice to my younger self does not matter what other people think of you. That is their business. It matters what you think about you. And that's like the most important relationship is the one that you have with yourself. So that that's the advice that I'm giving to my younger self. Um, all right, y'all. Well, we are at time. This was just an absolutely amazing discussion. I wish we had more time for it. Um, we're certainly going to have to have you back to have some different conversations around everything from a uh, you know, the lo-fi to uh, capitalism, <laughs> throw back to our earlier conversation. Um, so everybody that does it for our panel, I, I really wanna thank Ameka, Wale, Julio and Brandon for their contributions to this discussion. Um, you can head over to the at AIGACT on Instagram handle uh, to see our work from the panelists. You can find a recording from of this discussion and you can also interact with other folks from the design community. And speaking of which, please get on AIGA Connecticut's public Slack workspace. You can visit our website at connecticut.aiga.org. Go to get involved in the navigation and select join our public Slack. And feel free to share your thoughts about this session and any other programming that you'd like to see. So thanks y'all for your time and have a good evening. All right, thanks y'all. Take care. Peace, Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome.